Welcome to another event in our London Luminaries lecture series. This is the second of our talks on the theme of love and death. More will follow in the autumn, so please do check our London Luminaries website for more information. My name is Judith Hawley and I'm your chair for this evening. I want to thank you for watching, those of you who are listening live, and to those of you who might have tuned in later on on YouTube. Our first speaker is Claire Goff, who is director of Soane's Country House, Pittshanger Manor, which also has an amazing picture gallery. Our second is Dr. Matthew Turner, who, among other things, is the museum director at Turner's House in Twickenham. They'll be talking about a particular kind of love, male friendship. And the particular friendship they're discussing is that between two extraordinary figures, the architect, John Soane, and the artist, J.M.W. Turner. They will speak to you now on the theme of Soane and Turner, architecture, art, friendship, and fishing. Over to you, Claire and Matthew. Judith, thank you so much. Um, it's an absolute delight um, for Matthew and I to be here tonight to talk to you about two people we are fascinated by, um, John Soane and J.M.W. Turner, two creative geniuses of their day who are also great friends. Though Soane was a whole 22 years Turner senior, they formed an incredibly strong bond that kept them close confidants and supportive friends from the 1790s right through until Soane's death at the age of 83 in 1837, a close friendship of over 40 years. So tonight we're going to take a look at a number of ways in which their lives intertwined, from how they first met through the Royal Academy and the crucial role that the RA played in each of their careers, but also to that other major influence on both of them, their time spent in Rome and discovering beautiful classical architecture. We're going to look at the two country homes that they built, Sohn at Pitsanger, which is where we are tonight in the breakfast room at Pitsanger, Pitsanger in Ealing, and Turner at Sandicombe Lodge in Twickenham, and the time they spent together in the country, um, engaging in, in, in countryside pursuits, particularly fishing, and the similarities between the two. And we might just touch on how they both built up a reputation of being rather curmudgeonly. But while we go through their lives, we're going to try and draw out the ways in which each man had a really notable influence on the other and helped shape their respective lives. So let's just start by introducing our two protagonists. So here they are. You've got John Johnson, 1753 to 1837. So born in 1753 in Goring-on-Thames to John Soane, another John Soane, son of a bricklayer. So very humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. And um, next to him, we have this, uh, I think, very remarkable um, self-portrait of um, J.M.W. Turner, Joseph Mallord William Turner, um, looking straight out at us um, in a very confident, perhaps slightly challenging way. Um, also from um, what we might now call a working class background, his father was a, a hairdresser and wig maker, um, born in Covent Garden in Maiden Lane. Um, and perhaps um, he and Soane, um, in fact, I'm almost certain that he and Soane would have um, had lots of um, points of contact in their lives coming from their backgrounds. Because although Turner was born in Covent Garden, he spent a lot of his youth on the Thames as well, uh, particularly um, up in Brentford, uh, not terribly far from where we are now, in fact. So the two men had, uh, before they'd even met, really, uh, many things that uh, might well have drawn them together. And um, I love these two portraits. I'm particularly uh, uh, drawn to the portrait of uh, Soane, uh, pointing at his own architecture. Uh, uh, really telling us uh, almost everything that we need to know in the one portrait about uh, what he considers important in himself. Yes, very much um, putting himself out on show, demonstrating that he is now an intellectual, um, a man, a man of architecture um, with that portrait. Um, Turner, of course, um, much younger than, um, than Soane, so he was a mere toddler when um, Soane went off on his grand tour. But just to give you a bit of an introduction of how, how a man like so possibly managed to afford to go off on his grand tour. And the answer is that at the age of 15, um, Soan had his sort of first, first breakthrough moment when he was apprenticed to the up and coming um, um, architect, George Dance 
the younger and, and work for dance. And dance was a founding member of the Royal Academy and would have encouraged Soane to join the schools there, which was um, free. And Soane um, submitted an application to win a scholarship for a grand tour. And I'm just going to show you in the next slide. And here it is. It was a design for a triumphal bridge. And on the right, you see um, the plan of the, of, the, um, of the design. And on the left, you see um, a, a picture created by Soane's great collaborator, Gandhi, of, um, um, of, 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 of sort of a 3D um, um, development of it. And this is what won him a scholarship. This was an incredible coup for, for Soane, the son of the Berkeley. He won the gold medal. And as a result, he was introduced to King George III, who had actually sponsored the scholarship. And it was awarded by the RA to the most promising student in architecture. And what he got was £60 a year for three years to go off on his grand tour. So Soane heads off on his grand tour, travels through France to get to Italy, and in fact spends all of his time in Italy. But while he's there, he gets very much exposed, not just to Italian architecture, but also to Greek architecture, for the vast expanse of Greek architecture that can be seen across Italy and Sicily and Paestum and various other places. So this picture here is rather interesting. It's, um, it's a picture of the Villa Negroni. So Stone turns up in Rome, in 1778, just the year before, in 1777, um, in Rome, they had excavated a, a Roman villa that hadn't been known about before, the Villa Negroni, very close to the, the Bath of Diocletian. And it caused an immense stir right across Rome that rippled right across um, the Western world because they were amazed by the, um, the detail of the frescoes that they found on the rooms in the Villa Negroni. And this is an image done at the time, um, a print produced at the time of one of the rooms in the Villa Negroni. And um, not only did it, did it greatly influence um, um, society at the time, but it had a massive impact on Soane. And I think you, anybody who knows Soane's architecture will recognize so many hints from this image itself of, of the impact that it had on Soane through, through the structural detail, the colors that he uses, the use of faux marbling in his designs. And all of these things are influences that you can see at Pitsanger, Soane's, um, Soane's country home. But here's just another illustration of the sorts of architecture that, that Soane would have been coming across in, um, in his travels. But of course, this was many years before um, um, Turner could get to, um, to Italy, because one of the issues that was around at the time is, was the interference to people's mm. plans to go on their grand tour of, of politics on the continent. Of course, the French Revolution and later the Napoleonic Wars, which made it very difficult to travel. Indeed. And I think it's worth pointing out so two things about the grand tour. One, um, as uh, Claire has just been saying, it was immensely influential on um, really all forms of artistic production across Europe, not just in Britain, but very much so in Britain. Um, just to get back to Turner for a little bit, Turner born, as I mentioned before, in Covent Garden. Covent Garden designed entirely as, a, um, as an Italian piazza in the middle of London. Um, Turner would have, uh, from um, the youngest of ages, had been surrounded by the best that Britain could have provided um, in terms of classical architecture. But the other important um, element of the Grand Tour was the people that you met. Um, and um, Soane uh, made some um, incredibly important connections that were to serve him well through the rest of his life, as did many other uh, largely young men. Uh, some young women uh, went on Grand Tours as well, but largely young men, um, which they then uh, retained when they came back to, um, to Britain. Um, and for an artist and an architect, uh, one of the elements of the Grand Tour was that it put you directly in touch with um, patrons, future patrons, uh, people who would go on to become uh, prime ministers, for instance, uh, as happened with Soane uh, when he uh, met uh, William Pitt, who would go on to become prime minister. So um, the Grand Tour formed a really crucial part of uh, the British cultural life. It wasn't only um, a chance for uh, rich young aristocrats to go somewhere else to get drunk. Uh, it did really have an important part to play. And by cutting off that uh, opportunity or that range of opportunities for young artists, um, one of the uh, perhaps unforeseen uh, results of the French Revolution was that a young man like Turner, um, a young artist like Turner, was really thrown back on his own resources 
um, in a way that uh, perhaps so uh, might not have been. So um, not going on the Grand Tour wasn't the same as perhaps uh, not being able to go into railing today. It really was uh, a hugely profoundly influential, uh, 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 potentially negatively, or also potentially positively influential um, occurrence. Yes, and that's it's interesting because that that in a way um, was part of the inspiration for Soane when um, when he built his country house Pitsanger in eighteen hundred in setting up um, um, displaying there his collection because he was very conscious that young men of the time, and sadly it was mainly young men, um, young men at the time couldn't go on these grand tours. So by acquiring artifacts, many of them um, ancient pieces of, um, of statuary from, from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and putting them on display in his house, he would enable his young students to come and draw them and learn from them in the way that Soane had by drawing mm -hmm. places such as this that we see um, in this picture here. Um, but but um, as, as Matthew says, it was immensely influential for Soane. Um, he met there so many of his of his future circle and and future clients. And on the basis of that, he slowly was able to build his career when he was back um, in London. So much so that um, he got the commission, which was a huge breakthrough for Soane, of becoming the architect and surveyor to the Bank of England. And finally, really started climbing the the ladder at the Royal Academy. We wanted really now to spend a, a little bit of time talking about um, both of Soane and Turner at the Royal Academy. We don't actually know precisely when they met. Um, it was certainly in the early 1790s. We know that they must have met by 1792 because um, Soane, who was a great diary keeper, which has been very, very helpful for us to find out so much about him. But in 1792, Soane writes a note about, about having um, um, chatted with Turner. But um, Soane was elected an associate um, member of the Royal Academy in 1795 at the age of 42. But wow, what a speedy rise for Turner, who gets elected in 1799 at the mere age of 24. Uh, uh, the youngest, um, still to this day. And rather nicely for two such great friends, they were both elected full academicians. I can never say that word, but you know, <laughs> uh, on the very same day in 1802. So you've got Soane there at age 48 and and, and Turner and mm -hmm. Minnow at um, 27. Um, very impressive. And they soon became very, very involved yes. in the running of the institution. I think in the institution, I think Soane was immensely aware of the debt that he owed to the Royal Academy, that step up, but getting that scholarship um, to him. Um, and they both um, quickly got elected as professors. Indeed. Um, fascinating, slightly slow workers. It's very interesting. Um, so utterly prodigious in his, his work as an architect, slightly slow, having been um, elected as um, an architecture, a professor of architecture in 1806, doesn't quite manage to do his first lecture until 1809. And, and, and there are some comments about um, the slowness of the two of them. Um, but I think a, a distinct advantage on his predecessor, who, uh, if I'm uh, right, didn't give any lectures at all. So yes. uh, <laughs> at least once every um, seven or eight years is better than none at all. Um, and Turner um, also incredibly slow in um, producing his lectures. And I suspect, or I'd like to think that the two of them, um, as well as doing the work that they were doing in their careers, were also doing an enormous amount of uh, research. And I like to think of the two of them sharing their research as part of being professor of perspective. We know that Turner went away and um, really did a great deal of thinking about architecture uh, specifically. And it um, seems to me to be absolutely impossible that the two men didn't talk to each other um, about the things that they'd been reading, the ideas that they were, that they, that they were having. A huge amount, a huge amount. And perhaps this is a good moment to, to talk a little bit about their, their country houses, because I think that's where mm. a lot of the conversations happened. So um, let's take you now to um, just bear with us while we oh, marvelous. there it is um, to the two houses that they built in the country. So this here is Pitsanger, um, built in what was the village of Ealing. Um, um, London very definitely did not stretch out to Ealing at that stage. London stopped at Marble Arch. So Ealing was a village. It wasn't complete countryside, but a village out of the country. And what you can see on the left is um, a, a, a watercolour from 1832. And the, the green that you can see on the left is the village green. So you can see it really was in the, in the centre of the village, but it had a park of 28 acres to um, stretching out beyond it in the background. You can just see the Serpentine Lake of the park. And there is his, his, his grand villa, 
Pitsanger, um, and a photo of it as it looks um, today, still very much um, the same. And interestingly built by Soane very much to um, note that he was now very much an established member um, um, of society um, and needed to have a country home to, to support that new fan status, but very much a place where he wanted to entertain those friends he had met on his grand tour, bring them back to Pitsanger and over a glass of nice red wine, probably not um, French wine because the Napoleonic Wars, but some, some good port wine, he would try to persuade them to commission from him a, um, a, a, a new house. So that is Pitsanger. And here we have Sandicum Lodge. Sandicum Lodge. Um, what a contrast in many ways, where, whereas Soane's um, country house was very much part of his, uh, his business. Uh, Turner's country house was um, a retreat, a place to get away from it all. Um, we'll come to some of the architectural similarities in a moment, but I hope you can see from these two slides that uh, compared to Pitsanger, um, Sandicum is a significantly smaller, um, a word that we often use as domestic. Um, and the um, area in which it was, it was built, Twickenham, uh, very much like Ealing, very much in the countryside, um, and very much um, like Ealing, um, also um, a place of um, a, a, a country villas, um, you know, a, a summer recreations for wealthy people. Um, there were plenty of um, places all around um, Sandycombe um, that were uh, very grand and very magnificent, some of which had even been designed by Soane himself. Um, but Turner doesn't seem to have spent any time um, um, uh, chasing up potential clients in any of these sort of places. Rather, he seems to have come to Sandicum uh, to relax, to get away from it all. Um, he had his studio, his gallery, and um, lived all in the same place. And so I think Sandicum really was um, an alternative to all of that. Um, it was a, 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 yes, a quiet country retreat. So interestingly, we know that um, Turner was a really regular visitor at, um, at Pitsinger. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of accounts of, of Turner being there from um, both um, Soane's notebooks, but also Mrs. Soane's um, notebooks. And rather delightfully, we know that, um, if you can see that from, from, from the picture here, that, that Pitsinger not dissimilarly to Sandicum Lodge, was grand in entertaining spaces, but was not enormous in, um, in, in the domestic spaces. And it only had bedrooms for the family. And the only non-family member who ever stayed over at Pitsang was Turner. And that was a sign of how close that friendship was. I've always suspected that um, Soane, who was a great party giver, um, had huge big garden parties out in the, um, at the gardens um, that you can see uh, alongside the lake, big dinners in the dining room that you can see the dining room in the dance wing just the left um but it was very much come out to my party and then please go home and i suspect that that Soane was not fit to be seen over breakfast except by his great mate um turner but you can see in um the the, the watercolor you can see that um that lake in the distance and a second lake a further away and that is the fishing lake and what we do know is that um turner and Soane would often fish together at yes, Pitsanger and there are accounts of, of, of Turner in fact walking over from, from Twickenham mm -hmm. to come and fish and we have, have ideas of them um, sort of sitting knee deep in water talking about light and the fall of light on mm. the water and so on. How wonderful. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and um, um, it's, it's rather it's rather nice actually because Soane was such a prodigious worker mm. he didn't have many pastimes and I think Fishing was really one of the few things yeah. that he did where he could sort of unwind and relax and lovely to do that. And, and very much the same for Turner. And we have reports that um, yeah, some of his clients would complain that he was spending too much time fishing, not <laughs> enough time painting or doing art. And this particular drawing may well be from uh, one of those situations. Uh, he was um, um, sent or he went up to Tabley Hall, home of um, Sir John Lester. Um, and there's some suggestion that, 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 that these fish came from um, his river. Uh, up there rather than um, Turner spending time working. Damn it. What a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned before that um, so he had many, many purposes that he um, had for, for Pitsanger when he built it. And I mentioned before that part of it was to, to use it to get his friends and, and potential clients to, to, to commission from him um, um, a, a, a new piece of, of architecture or some work. But one of the other things he did, as I mentioned, was he used it to display his collection. 
his growing collection and very much wanted it to be a, a basis for informing and, and inspiring and educating his, um, his, both his children but also his pupils. And um, he displayed here, as I've mentioned, old artifacts of Roman and Greek um, 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 statuary, but also contemporary art. And of course, some of the contemporary art that he displayed was indeed Turner's. So um, Pitsang was built between 1800 and 1804. And we have records that in 1804, Mrs. Soane, Eliza Soane, who was indeed a great friend of Turner's as well, went along to Turner's Gallery and purchased two pictures. This one here, the refectory at Kirkstall Abbey, and then this other one of um, a rather lovely um, um, watercolour of the Valley de Aust. I don't know how you pronounce that, but <laughs> um, Italy. <laughs> from, um, uh, uh, from Italy. And um, those were displayed in Turner's picture room. And that is the small drawing room um, at Pitsanger, very different from the room that we're sitting in here. Um, um, it's got bright red walls, which Soane designed specifically to show off his contemporary art to the best possible effect. And they were hung alongside um, that great series of paintings, Hogarth's A Rake's Progress, which um, Eliza previously bought in 1802, and a couple of canalettos either side of the fireplace. So what, what an amazing room. And of course, this was a, of relatively contemporary art, um, turn of very much contemporary of zones, but, but Hogarth and Canaletto um, only from a short period beforehand. So a really stunning room of, of, of art. And I think intriguingly, um, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but the Kirkstall painting, uh, Kirkstall watercolour, very much um, in sort of Gothic um, picture, um, the, uh, the inside of um, an abbey that's now being used to house cattle. I don't know if you can sort of see them there. And the um, basement um, cellar has been sort of somewhat flooded, uh, very much sort of with, uh, playing on Gothic and Romantic themes, whereas the uh, Swiss, uh, watercolour, uh, very much uh, playing on um, perhaps some of the ideas of the sublime, but also uh, thinking about light, thinking about how light is uh, a, 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 an important part of the picture, an important part of the artist's um, uh, a purpose. And we'll come back to light in, in, um, in a moment. So we're just going to show you a tiny bit, we want to talk a little bit about, about architectural influences on each other. And we don't have any written records of um, the influence that Soane had on Turner when he was designing um, Sandicum Lodge. But it's very obvious when you look at the two buildings how, um, um, how much Soane must have influenced Turner. And they must have discussed it, you know, while they were knee deep in that mud, um, <laughs> um, chatting about it. So just to give you a taste, this very room that we were in, I don't know whether you can see from around us, is this picture on the left. This is Soane's breakfast room. And there is a rather gorgeous picture commissioned by Joseph Gandhi that was used actually to, do, um, to show it at the RA. Um, in the summer exhibition to display the architecture that Sony had been doing. And the room demonstrates that most Sonian of all features, the canopy dome ceiling. Um, here, the handkerchief dome, this rather gorgeous, you can just see the, the, um, the blue sky, um, inspired by the Pantheon in Rome, the blue sky peeping out to an Italian sky, and it's depicted in, in Gandhi's drawing. And um, that was an absolutely archetypal feature um, that, that Sony used, and we'll see it um, um, repeated in Sandicum Lodge. And it's just quite fun in the next slide. Um, you can see how, rather than in a room, he also did it on the, um, um, on the, on the two pillars to the entrance to um, Pitsanger. If you look at these two pillars, can you see that that is exactly the same um, canopy dome that he'd used inside um, at, in the breakfast room? And the canny amongst you may know that it is this design here of these two pillars that many, many years later in the 1920s um, inspired um, um, when there was a competition to design the telephone box. This was the inspiration um, behind um, the telephone box. But um, this is the other massive um, um, design feature that, that, that Soane became so famous for, the other canopy dome ceiling here, the starfish dome at Soane's, um, in Soane's library here at Pitsanger. And just moving on, we'll show you um, um, some, some pictures mm -hmm. of both Pitsanger and of Sandicum Lodge. And you can see, see the similarity between the two. Absolutely. So on the left, you've got um, some pictures of the stairwell at Pitsanger, and on the right, that's Sandicum. It's, 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 it's Sandicum. Um, 
if you haven't been to Sandakan, do come. Um, it's um, a, a great visit, but perhaps I would always say that. Uh, but one of the, I think, main features, one of the things that I love most about it is the staircase. Um, and it really is, I think, a fantastic piece of uh, architecture using what is a very small space, really, in quite a dramatic way. But I think if you look closely at the um, slide on the far right and the far left, you'll be able to see the similarities. The light is being drawn into the interior space and used as uh, as a feature. Uh, it's not only there to, uh, to to provide light. It's also there, in fact, to be a uh, an element in the experience of the building. And that that is absolutely a feature of Seven. Um, known as the master of light in architecture, of course, Turner, master of light in paintings. And here on the left, you can see the entrance hall, or you call it the tribune at Pitsanger. And if you can just see, I don't know whether you can see my cursor up there, that's one of the internal um, windows in um, the tribune at Pitsanger. And it's been um, filled with, with amber tinted glass so that it fills the room not with hard harsh northern european light from london but softens it to make it much more like the italian light that son had seen on his grand tour and on the right you're seeing the effects that that Absolutely. turner himself did at sandigan yes and that. and um it can't be a coincidence that um, both of these men were drawn to the color yellow Mm. Uh, we will see that um, a little bit later in some paintings by Turner. But yellow plays an important part in their, uh, 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 in their oeuvre, if you can call it that. And what we're seeing here in the middle is the uh, effect of the light um, at Turner's house on the wall uh, coming through the uh, ley light, which we can see on, on the right. And it can be no coincidence that we're looking at perhaps a sun uh, moving across the wall uh, as the actual sun moves across the sky. So I really encourage you, we're going to canter through these a bit, but really encourage you to come and visit both Pitsanger and, and Sandicum and just look mm -hmm. at look at that really striking similarity. Quite amazing when you think about it that, you know, Turner was not an architect and yet he managed to build this house. Absolutely. Um, but, but I kind of imagine there's sort of, you know, scribbles on the back of napkins by, <laughs> by Soane making some suggestions. Here again, mm -hmm. on the left, you've got um, how Soane mm -hmm. plays with reflections mm. from, from the stained glass. This is in the conservatory at Pisanga on the right, that gorgeous reflection yes. from, from the ley light. And here, just an indication of those glorious um, um, repeated arches that are such a feature of Sohn's work. On the left, though, that's Sandigan, and that's what and that's what's Turner's done. It is, yes. And here, the play yeah. of light that Sohn's doing in, in, in Pisanga. So you'll see it. Come and visit, and you'll Come see. And, visit, yeah, yes. um, and we'd be delighted mm. to, to show you around and, and take a look at all those um, all those um, similarities, distinct differences, but similarities. Mm. But moving on, also talking about other areas where the two must discuss things. This is absolutely fascinating. Mm. I think this is a this is a rather beautiful picture by Turner of some reflective domes. And oh, what a surprise! Here is how Soane applies reflective um, convex mirrors um, at um, his other home, his main home in London, um, in Lincoln Fields, what is now the Soane Museum. So, you know, you can imagine they must have yeah. been discussing these things. Um, they were, the, the picture done Absolutely. at a similar time. And, um, and so Soane is, is um, in Lincoln's Inn, which you must all go and, go and see if you haven't already, uh, a, a master at um, using light in uh, imaginative different ways to enhance the experience of being in the room. And if we look just very briefly at the picture on the left, uh, again, coming back to this use of colored light, uh, most of that light, none of that light, in fact, is, is um, electric. It's all natural light coming through tinted glass. Now, one of the things that Soane was incredibly famous for was um, for designing the first purpose-built gallery, picture gallery in Britain. And that is, of course, Dulwich Picture Gallery, the stunning Dulwich Picture Gallery. And here is a picture of, of Dulwich Picture Gallery. And one of the key features, which is a recurring theme in Soane's architecture, is the, um, the fact that it's lit from the roof light enabling there to be plenty of room on the walls for the paintings, but beautiful light from above. Um, and look at those red walls. So no surprises then to go and look at this picture of Turner's mm. Gallery. 
um, built in, um, in, in the late 18, um, um, 18, 1819 or so and finished, I think, 1823. Yes. And here is, here is Turner's Gallery. Right. So undoubtedly, there we go, they're the same. Huge, huge, huge influence. And interestingly, you would, can't see it in either of these um, images, but um, Turner's Gallery was uh, a specially heated, he, a, a used a rather ingenious sort of heating system which drew heat from fires in the rest of the house. And Sin himself, very interested yeah, in yeah. Uh, modern technology, heating. underfloor yeah. heating. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, can it be just a coincidence these two men are interested in heating? I can't imagine it. Uh, it I think it's a yeah. lovely indication about how they were both really fascinated mm. in new inventions, the latest Completely. technology. So absolutely, there's examples of underfloor or mm. in the wall heating at Pitsanger. But similarly, there's a lovely drawing in the Sony archives of a, of a new display mechanism mm. for um, Turner, designed by Sohn, for Turner to, to show his pictures when he's giving a lecture at the yes. Royal Academy. I think they were always fiddling with a yes. new idea of how can we do how can we do this better. These were sort of very active brains that never stopped and as we think, you know, either over dinner mm. over a very large glass of port in the monk's mm. dining room or um or down in that in that muddy fishing lake, <laughs> they would be discussing these ideas. But all was not smooth in that lovely relationship Sadly between Turn, Turner and and so, so this is a rather fascinating picture. This is a picture called Forum Romanum for Mr. Soane's Museum, which Soane had sort of commissioned from Turner, so a painting by mm -hmm. Turner, but was rejected by Turner. Yes. Oh, by Soane, by, by, so, by, so, by so, so, And um, Turner had spent quite a lot of time trying to get it exactly right. So Turner had visited Italy for the first time in 1819. We currently have an exhibition about that very visit at Turner's house, so do come and see it. Um, and came back, and he must have spent time talking to his friend about the importance of his grand tour, and proceeded to produce this painting just for him, and to make it as accurately uh, 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 correct as he possibly could, which for Turner uh, is quite something he's not often uh, known for being uh, uh, accurate in his painting. But nevertheless, when Soane saw it, um, he sort of said uh, the equivalent of thanks but no thanks, and you might think that that would have um, been a blow to Turner and uh, really um, uh, 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 put their relationship in jeopardy. Seemingly not so. Um, so rather graciously uh, 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 consented to pay for it. I think it was 500 guineas. I mean, that's an astronomically huge amount of money. Uh, Turner sort of said something along the lines of, well, you know, you win some, you lose some. Kept the painting. Also never cashed the check. So um, when he died, um, the cheque was still in his possession. So um, I can only imagine it was a bit of a blow, particularly when the space was filled by a painting uh, by one of Turner's friends, uh, but uh, William um, Colcott, um, Augustus Colcott. But um, nevertheless, um, I, think, I think a wonderful indication of how these two men um, yeah, got on, despite... Yeah, and, and weathered the ups and downs of a relationship. And perhaps nothing illustrates mm. this more than this rather lovely sketch of Eliza Soane, Soane's wife. So many of you may know the rather sad story about the Soane family. Um, you know, we've talked about curmudgeonly people, and he certainly was curmudgeonly. Um, and very sadly, Soane fell out utterly, disastrously with his two sons. And um, the situation got so severe that in 1810, Mrs. Soane insisted that, that they needed to leave Pitsanger. She couldn't be in the country any longer. She needed to go back be surrounded by society so they moved back to links in fields and then catastrophically in 1815 an anonymous letter is published in the champion um, which um, which is a, a sort of a, a paper of the time which criticized very severely the work of john so and there is rather sweetly and this is a testament to um to their friendship there's a record of turner being the person who accompanies so in 1815 to the offices of the champion to identify the handwriting of the person who wrote and written the letter and who has written it but George Soane, John's son. And Soane says this has been the death knell for his wife Eliza and lo and behold just a few weeks later in November 1815 Eliza dies. And it is so sorry Turner who is the one who comes round and supports 
Soane and indeed spends Christmas Eve with Soane that year and supports him through it. So this picture is really rather a lovely story. I think, Matthew, do you want to say about how, how, yes. how Turner um, found it? Indeed. Well, it's by John Flaxman, who was a friend of both. He was a sculptor um, and he also um, a, a keen fisherman. Um, and we know that he fished he with both men. Um, so Flaxman produced this drawing, which then um, was given to uh, John Jackson, who was a portrait painter, who used it as the basis for a portrait of um, Eliza. Jackson died and Turner um, bought some lots from his sale, um, including this. Um, we don't know whether Turner intended to give it to Soane. Um, I can only imagine that he must have done. I mean, what, I can't imagine he would have, would have wanted to keep it. But it's such a touching gesture, I think, to um, go out, find something that is connected to your friend, um, and then in his moment of, of, of greatest despair, uh, use it as a gift uh, to help him um, not just get over this moment, but to remember uh, his beautiful wife. Uh, and so, so was absolutely devoted to Eliza. Mm, she was a mm. brave woman to be even able to put up with him, both in his arts, which were very high, but also his dance. And and Turner gave it to him when um, so was knighted yes. in 1831, which was a very lovely thing. And you can see it today in Links and Fields with um, a lovely tribute underneath it that um, um, that, that Soane has written to his wife. Um, um, Soane, in fact, lives for many years after um, um, after the death of his wife. Um, he doesn't die until 1837. But just for us perhaps to wrap up, a couple of things that it's just interesting to note. Um, Soane, having fallen out completely with his sons, decides to leave his home and his entire collection to the public to be a place to inspire future um, 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 future young people in their quest to become architects and, 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 and to inspire them with his collection. And it seems very likely that that decision to leave his home and his, his collection to the public must have been an inspiration yes. to Turner when he himself also decided to do the Turner Completely. quest. Yes. Um, so, 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 um, a sad reason for us to be the beneficiaries of of Soane's um, collection, but something we are delightfully lucky to um, benefit from today. But I wanted to finish up with one lovely tribute to the friendship between these two men. This is a rather beautiful painting by Turner, painted um, in 1839, so just shortly after Soane had died in 1837. It's entitled um, um, Rome, Ab 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 Ancient Rome, with Ag Ag oh, I can never pronounce this, sorry, Agrippina um, landing with the ashes of Germanicus, the triumphal bridge and the palace of the Caesars restored. Now, what's really interesting to see, if you look closely at this glorious photo with the classic Turner traits of, of light, but if you look closely at that bridge, that is the triumphal bridge that Soane had designed in order to win his scholarship to go um, on his grand tour, his scholarship from the Royal Academy. So a really special tribute from a very mm. special friend who had stuck with Soane through those highs and lows over the years when, um, when he had died. And on that Marcus. note, we thought we yes. would hand back over um, to Judith um, mm. to tell us about the rest of the series and um, to take any questions if yes. you like. Absolutely fantastic. And well, this has been an inspiring talk and it's been lovely that you've been in the space of, 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 of Soane's yes. breakfast room. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Chris. Thank you to Rachel. And I hope to see you again at our, at our next talk.